This podcast episode was originally recorded for the Healing Souls podcast and is being refurbished for your enjoyment. Hello and welcome to Healing Souls podcast. This is Natasha Helfer. I am your host and I am super glad to have my guest Kristen Benyon on with us today. We are going to be talking about some sensitive topics these days, you know, with so many things that I think we've been seeing in the news. And, you know, obviously the last few weeks here in the United States have led to a lot of uh, civil unrest and very disheartening, you know, kind of uh, happenings, especially on the Capitol building. And it's interesting, you know, we were talking a little bit about how we're going to approach this topic because it's so sensitive these days, how as psychologists, On the one hand, we're all about bridging divides, relational health. How do we, you know, do a lot of what Biden was talking about yesterday with unity, you know, driven kind of ideas. On the other hand, uh, whenever there's, you know, kind of human behavior that, that we're concerned about, there's a psychological, you know, kind of explanation or research that goes into that. And it's important, I think, to be able to, to talk about these topics without, necessarily automatically seeing it as divisive, just the fact that we're going to talk about them. So I'm hoping that that's the spirit in which we can, we can have this conversation tonight. Hopefully our listeners being willing to just kind of see what we have to say. (laughs) But before we go much further, I want to introduce Kristen. So hello. Hello. Kristen is joining me from Utah and she is a dear friend of mine. We know each other. Gosh, several years now, probably like five Mm -hmm. or seven years now that we've been networked together. And we met through our association as a sex therapist and our our kind of journey as being sex therapists. So that's kind of interesting because it's not exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight, but maybe a little bit. (laughs) We're going to talk about sex a little bit. So (laughs) Always pull it in somehow. (laughs) So (laughs) why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your practice, and kind of what what type of work you're, you're involved in? Sure. I am the owner of Intimate Connections Counseling and I've been practicing for uh, almost 12 years. Sex therapist as probably five or six by now. And I love what I do. I've worked predominantly with women in the intersection of religion and sexuality, but not not exclusively. I am nearing the end of my PhD program where I've kind of taken a turn and I'm digging actually a lot more deeply into gender and sexuality representation in media. And that's just very interesting to me. And so throughout the, my program, I've been exposed to a lot of kind of the, the things that we're going to talk about tonight. And it's been really interesting to see through the lens of, of what I've learned uh, with what's happening in real time in our, in our country. So. Yeah, no, that's totally, totally cool. And I'll, I'll probably invite you to come back on to speak more specifically about that. But right now we're going to talk about, you know, this, rise that we've seen in kind of the mainstream, I mean, conspiracy theories are, you know, probably always. old. I mean, there's, they're always around. Not all conspiracy theories are necessarily dangerous. And some of them even sometimes have some truth associated mm-hmm. to that. But we have seen kind of this mainstreaming that at least seems unique in my experience in the last few years of my life. And mm-hmm. also with, you know, some ideas that really don't have a lot of evidence or backing to them. And then we see the motivation of those conspiracy theories leading to behavior that has become very problematic. And I think both you and I, given that we do come from backgrounds where, you know, we grew up in kind of religiously conservative communities. And I don't know if this is completely true. You can maybe talk about this a little bit, but It seems to me like sometimes in those communities, there's a vulnerability to some of these conspiracy theories, because I've seen a lot of my friends and even family members fall prey. I don't know if that's a nice word, but fall Mm -hmm. prey to kind of this thinking and be very concerned and very scared and very serious and not exactly sure how to, how to talk about that very well without things getting quite heated and sure. uh, And I've heard this a lot from my clients and from other friends that this has been an experience they're they're having amongst their social circles. Is that something that you're experiencing as well? Uh, Absolutely. It is. I agree. It's very hard to talk about because even in the best with the best of intentions, it can come across as critical when maybe we're just trying to talk about what we might be seeing. And that's usually not my intention at all. 
but I, I do think there is a bit of a vulnerability for those who come from like higher control or higher behavioral commitment uh, systems mm -hmm. to be a bit more vulnerable to say a new charismatic leader, which is quintessential for any sort of like movement that's conspiratorial in, in thinking or even up to the extreme, like a cult, right? Like there has, there's a movement, there's some figure that someone's following. And so if you, it just makes sense to me that if you come from a background where you're used to kind of outsourcing your authority or thinking, maybe not fully outsourcing, but thinking at the end of the day, I don't have the, all the answers, someone else does. I think that that could contribute and does contribute, I think, to a bit bit of vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. And we see that not necessarily even in religious, but we've seen even with a lot of military or police yes. officers, which also kind of tend to have that author downward authority type of mentality in the in the ways that they've been trained. And we saw quite a bit of that, surprisingly, at least I was surprised at how many people that were being, you know, charged and arrested in the days following the insurrection, uh, how many of those people had served our country, how many military of those backgrounds, military backgrounds or had wow. served on our policing forces, which we depend on, uh, you know, in our you country bet. so much. And, and that just seems like also kind of an authoritarian system that they've been highly functioning in. Absolutely. With, a, you know, with a leader who kind of tells you, these are the things that you should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and often too, within those systems, I like that you pulled in, it's not just religion. It can be any sort of the system there, there can be a, sus a suspicion or just like an us versus, or just the outside group should be we should be skeptical <laughs> at, at the, the very least up to, we should be outright hostile in other, other realms. Right. And so just any system where there's top down, like there, there's just going to be a vulnerability, like we're saying. Yeah. Okay. So when we think about why, why do conspiracy theories take off? You know, what, what are they about? Again, from kind of a psychological perspective, how did those of us who study the social science see that being motivated by? Well, there are usually there in most of the literature, there's like three main ones, but I would add a, a different one at the end, but the top three. So there's epistemic motives, existential and social motives. So epistemic is that they explain. So the, the conspiracy helps them explain uh, a way that helps them retain a worldview, right? So it's just, it, it keeps their a safety for them. To, to help understand how the world is functioning, right? So, uh, well, I don't have an example right away, but like- well, like maybe something that, that they're feeling like uh, they don't understand or can't quite make sense of, or why mm -hmm. is this happening? Mm -hmm. We as humans don't like uncertainty, usually. Uh -huh. yes. We want to come up with stories and reasons <laughs> why yes. certain things might be the way they are. And so I think that's kind of what you're getting at, yep. right? Is, is filling in the blanks. Yes. And uncertainty is a theme that I think will pop up a lot in our discussion tonight, because I think that difficulty tolerating uncertainty, and I'm getting a little off, but that is, I think, an underpinning psychological factor mm -hmm. that does predispose people to conspiratorial thinking, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so epistemic, and then there's existential. So it provides them a security in an unsafe world. So again, brings meaning to Taught, trying to make sense of what is un, not understandable to them. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, and then social motives. So it can, that this one, this one's often, you know, it helps explain my misfortunes, like why it hasn't worked out for me, but it's worked out for all those elites or mm -hmm. it's worked out for all the X, Y, and Z people, but not me can maybe persecution a little bit, or, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of has some social explanation for, for it, it, it's all starting to make sense to them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, well, and, and quite frankly, we do live in kind of a prosperity culture. And what I mean by that is a lot of times the message is, if you do this and this and this, you should be able to get this and that. Yes. <laughs> you yes. Know, you go to college. The American, you the American to, dream. Right? If you work right? really hard, if you yeah. pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, if you do these things, you mm -hmm. will do great. And yet, 
you know, there is a lot of uncertainty. Not always are we rewarded for our efforts. So you can have very hardworking people not maybe get to the point where they thought they would be able to achieve wealth or other types of securities that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I would add on top of that. So any time there's a like widespread conspiracy theory or just something to be taken that's just going crazy. And I mean, they're found throughout history from the Salem witch trials, even before then, uh, all the way up through the satanic panic of the eighties, stranger danger of the seventies, like just queuing on now, like they're always precipitated by major social changes to social mores changing. Right. So Mm -hmm. women's rights, gay rights, civil rights, like Mm -hmm. just any big shift that's happening in the, the construction of what society is supposed to look like. And I'm using major air quotes with that for Mm -hmm. people who might be just listening to audio you know, that can really breed a lot of worry about, like, we need to explain what's happening, Mm -hmm. like that feeling. And often that's the devil or, or, um, you know, the, the other political party is causing Mm -hmm. this and they're doing it to usurp power or they're, you know, just, there's, there's a desperation to figure out why it's happening. And then it might come with like a motivation to, to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it brings an energy when they used to feel helpless, right? There's a a target now. Yeah. Yeah. So when there's a large systemic change Mm -hmm. where maybe there is a a threat to certain privilege or certain power, Mm -hmm. status quo, Mm -hmm. then that feels, you know, even though we would maybe say, we think that's really great that that's happening. (laughs) We see that as progress. Sure. Uh, all the things you mentioned, you know, female rights and civil rights and gay rights, but it's still key. It, it, it makes the system that was comfortable, uncomfortable. And the people who benefited from that also yes. feeling threatened. It can be very threatening, like mm-hmm. existentially threatening to, to some. Mm-hmm. And that, that is very motivating to mm-hmm. come out against, or, I mean, in the worst case scenarios, you know, turn to violence. Mm-hmm. to make it stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Which is why we're talking about this. A lot of people might say, well, who cares what people believe, but beliefs lead to actions. They lead to policies. They lead to groupings. They lead to all kinds of things as we have seen that can be quite, you know, that can really put a lot of people at risk. Um, yes. And that's really difficult to watch. And I get, I get the argument. I mean, there are some conspiracy theories that are harmless, like whether we landed on the moon or like, I mean, there are just some that are silly and just almost even fun to talk about because it's who really at the end of the day cares, Mm -hmm. you know, but, but there is this breaking point where it can turn into um, absolute harm. And like, take, for example, the satanic panic of the eighties. Do you remember Mm -hmm. where it was a lot of daycare workers were charged with the most horrific thing, which is usually at the core of a conspiracy theory, which is pedophilia or like harm to children. Right. And I mean, deck, like at least decades they spent in jail, which was ultimately proved to not be a thing. Like it didn't, there was no evidence at the end of the day. I mean, people's lives can be ruined by like wildfire conspiracies thread spreading through a culture or a society. Right. And I think we're seeing a lot of that popping up mm-hmm. in the last few years with the, the current wave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and kind of an interesting, um, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time, like you mentioned, there can be kind of like a sexual theme, you mm-hmm. know, something to do with a sexual panic. I think you mentioned that uh-huh. word before we came on. Do you want to talk a little bit about why that might be the case? Like why is sex so dangerous? it's so it's just so related to a lot of the things we've already kind of mentioned but big um social the way the society is structured that those changes are 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 made it's usually along the lines of gender or sex right and or or often more often than not and that is absolutely threatening so we'll think about like a like a pendulum Mm -hmm. it can swing so like right after the liberation of the 60s and 70s we got 
a lot of like swinging to the right where women were asked to start dressing much more boxy in the 80s and like much more like the ERA felt like it's just a lot of kind of clamping down even in the legislative sense right Mm -hmm. and so making certain things available for some populations but not for others in terms of of healthcare or information even Mm -hmm. right like it, it the biggest harms I believe come when it's, it's made legislatively as a response to a moral panic or a sex panic. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what, that's why I think a lot of people get a little confused with why are some people saying it's not like X, Y, and Z is not as bad as they're saying it is, or, or maybe we need to think about this a different way. It's because there are actual real harms that come through legislatively to prevent people from accessing what, that I believe are their rights, <laughs> you know, even on, on in, through a non-legislative lens, you know, there was a, one of the examples that often comes up is there was a belief, do you know, Pizzagate, are you familiar with Pizzagate, which is the genesis of QAnon? I don't think I am. Well, so there was this, this belief going around that Hillary Clinton was running a child sex ring out of a pizza oh, parlor. Right. And, oh, I guess I didn't realize it was a pizza in a, in Washington, D.C. and, you know, like the vitriol bubbled for so long, someone actually ended up taking a gun in there and bringing violence to that pizza site. And I mean, it's been attempted to have, you know, been burned down or whatnot, even since. And so, I mean, like there are actual physical harms that can come from things that actually don't have what we would think of as actual evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and when you mentioned the social factor, another thing I thought of is just the power of belonging to a group. Mm-hmm. You know, we know that we're all kind of pack animals or tribal creatures yes. um, and group belonging is just such an important part of feeling important, feeling special, feeling yep. unique, feeling valued, feeling heard. <laughs> so we have a group of people that kind of all congregate on something, especially when it has a, a kind of a moral panic or something that kind of has an anxious type of energy. That's very seductive. That's very oh. empowering, you know, and can, and can very really, connecting. Yeah. Like, sweep you mm-hmm. <laughs> get all your hormones. <laughs> off and running. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely part of it. I think too, there's, so if you think about like what happened over this last year, I think it was an absolute recipe for disaster, right? Like the isolation factor for so many people and the economic uncertainty. Oh my goodness. Lit with fuel from things being said in the media and on through many outlets, Mm -hmm. you know, but the, the isolation at home and starting to not be able to connect with those who they might have connection with, but they can connect through this online forum, which is essentially radicalizing, you know, to a belief system that ultimately led people to want to storm the Capitol. Yeah. You know, and it was an it was, I believe, an absolute recipe for disaster and, and tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a story that repeats itself, right? Yeah. And we can see lots of this. So, Yep. So, okay. So we've talked a, a lot about what's the motivation. Let's talk a little bit about why they're dangerous. I mean, we're kind of getting into that. Obviously, you know, they can lead to kind of a frenzy or like a righteous anger mm-hmm. and, you know, and we, we don't have to look far in history for people to be very justified in using violence for moral righteous feelings of distress and protecting, you know, your turf, you know, self-protection. Yep mentioned protection of children, protection of your country, protection of your family, your home. And so there really can be a motivation for violence, which is yep. very, of course, very scary and can lead to full-fledged wars, you know, yes. and calamities. But even if it's not full-fledged wars, it can lead to isolated forms of violence that can really like relational, like relational violence, like it can really, I mean, there's been a lot of people just even taking this last year that I don't even believe this is anecdotal. I think it's pretty widespread that just a lot of people couldn't even be at Thanksgiving dinner with family. You know, I mean, there's, there's real relational and spiritual harm that can come from feeling so passionately about 
something that is unable to bring connection with those that you find like the clo- that you're the closest with. Yeah. And I think that that has done incredible harm to relationships across our nation and worldwide right now. But yeah, I can't tell you how many people this Thanksgiving told me in mm-hmm. session something along the lines of maybe it's not so bad. I can't be with my family there. I just need to take it off, taking this off. Yeah. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, that's that, you know, you, you would have thought I would have seen more of like, yeah. oh, really sad. We can't have our current traditions. I mean, there was that too, but I'm just saying sure. I'm surprised at how many people were kind of like, it's nice to have that ready-made boundary for Excuse. me. Excuse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which leads to another kind of danger, which I think is this hostility or uh, othering, you know, when we yes. other people and we see people as less than us or qualify people, which, you know, has happened again throughout history without whether it's color of your skin or status of economic, you know, economic status or the ca- case systems, right? I mean, there's all yep. kinds of ways, gender, you mentioned sexual orientation that can, oh, they're, they're different. And that diff, that othering allows us to lose empathy and compassion and that human connection that keeps yes. us from, <laughs> you know, that, that, the, yeah, keeps that protection up for, for, you know, for treating others like we'd want to be treated, right? Which tends to be a value most people actually have, but not so much when you are able to other. Well, and at at its core, it's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. Like it's absolutely taking away the humanity of the other. And I think that's why you, I think that's why you and I, even at the beginning of this conversation, we, we, I've done enough podcasts with you where we're always like, okay, wait, how is this going to be received? Because we care. Like at the end of the day, we do care. I don't want to like other someone Um, that's not at my core value, but it's caused so much anxiety in our culture to even be able to have a conversation about what, what is going on with our training. 2020 was devastating to watch like since a little longer than that, but it's just to see how much disconnection was happening, how much suffering was happening, how much, you know, inability to just talk about what is happening with the country that we love so much. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's one of the reasons I love that we're talking about this is to hopefully just have a conversation and hopefully we see that start changing, but. Yeah. And I hope that we're being clear that this isn't like, oh, you fell for this. I did Mm -mm. not. Right. Because yeah, maybe I'm not a QAnon follower, but I, I have had plenty of stuff in my life that I've had to revisit or rethink or, you know, think about 10 years later going, why did I believe that? You know, I mean, this is like human, this is human. human. We all have the capacity for these kinds of, you know, uh, proclivities per se. Is that fair? Absolutely. It is. I'm so glad you just brought that up because that was actually one of the other little like bullet points I wrote down and just kind of extra thoughts is it spans like being taken up by one of the mainstream conspiracy theories or heading toward something that could eventually turn into a cult. Like that is, it, it is no respecter of persons. It does not, it, it spans socioeconomic background, educational background, racial, um, gender, all of it. Like it, I mean, there are some little factors that are a little more susceptible, but it's, it, it spans the spectrum. And I think I saw that. That was very evident. Did you see the Nexium documentary on HBO or Showtime? There were two of them. I have not seen that. Very I good. Heard that it was excellent. Both yeah. of them are great to watch. But that right there shows like it is no respecter of persons at all. It can you can be like the desire for connection and self improvement and wanting to make the world a better place is often at the core. And who in the world wouldn't sign up for something that at its core, I mean, just generally speaking, was pro, you know, purporting to be wanting to make the world a better place and had an edge on everything else. Right. Like, why not? Like, right. that's, right. duh. <laughs> right. And it fits kind of those things that we were talking about. It fits your, your anxieties in the moment, your insecurities yes. in the moment, you know, which again, throughout life, we all have, we're all mm-hmm. vulnerable those things. Mm -hmm. I think another danger that I just wanted to bring up as to why we are talking about this is that 
it also has a level of problematic issues for self-care. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, there's been a lot of conspiracy theories around like the anti-vax movement, right? Mm -hmm. Or not wearing masks, right? Or yep. are people going to get vaccinated now for COVID or not? And so sure. there can be a lot of, uh, or even like uh, real, real, you know, real dangerous cult-like behavior where eventually, you know, there's death by suicide or things of that nature. So there can be a, an element of in the process of trying to find usefulness and validity and health, actual, you know, problems to self-care and self-health. One of the quintessential markers of, 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 if we go to the extreme, like cult-like, is that at the end of the day, the things that are being asked of the followers are not, to use your, not self-care at all, like are not meeting their needs in any way and only end up serving the system or the person at the top. You know, so it doesn't start out that way at the beginning. It's mm -hmm. like, look at this new, amazing self-help thing, like in terms of Nexium or Scientology or, you know, like it's, it's really great. Look at this new community. I found my people. Like right. I have finally found my people mm -hmm. and then their house is being turned over to, you know, the title of their house or their car. Like, you know, they're being asked to cut people out of their lives and it just, it just, the, their personhood just keeps getting chipped. Yeah. chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. And yeah. that we're all susceptible to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we talked about motivation. We talked about why it's a problem and why we're bringing it up. And I do think it's the ethical responsibility of people like in our positions with our type of education and training to be talking about these things, whether it's physicians or mental health clinicians. And, and one thing that I was actually very proud of is that several of our associations Psychological associations did come out and make statements, even political statements against uh, kind of the past administration, because not because, you know, it, it's um, Republican versus Democrat. Mm -mm. It's because there were some real danger psychological kind of framings that we know uh, yeah. have an impact that led to some of the things that we've been so concerned about. So, you know, just just so everybody knows, I've supported both Republicans and Democrats in my political history and still do and have a lot of respect for people on both sides of the aisle. This isn't really, I'm hoping people understand so much a political party issue as it is these psychological concerns of treatment and, and patterns that we see in human behavior that can get dangerous. Yeah. So anyway, having said that, what what can we do about it? If I knew that, huh? you know, I, I, I mean, having more conversations like this, I I'm hoping to see more often, you know, I think the, the, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to need to be done in a big systemically, you know, a lot of what the problem over the past and, a, and I, I feel like problem is, is an understatement of the past few years, but specifically 2020 was the just ig ignitement of disinformation, you know, and, and people being so careless with what is true and what's fact. Um, and I'm hoping that there are some changes that we can see over all, but in our individual lives, I think compassion goes a long way you know, and understanding, I feel like I do understand why some of those people stormed the Capitol. I have a lot of thoughts about it, but I, I see a lot of suffering and a lot of feeling really disenfranchised. And, and I, I can understand that. And I seek to understand that's a, that's a value of mine. And so I think doing everything we can to be a safer place to talk with the people in our lives, but I do understand that some people are not allowing that to happen. You know, yeah. um, we can want to be there as much as we can and maybe they won't let it, but anyway. Yeah. Have you had thoughts? <laughs> well, and I mean, the sad truth is that there isn't, I mean, it, this is a difficult issue. There isn't great recourse. Mm -mm. In other words, from the reading that I've done, dispelling, you know, dispelling conspiracy theories or getting people to change their minds or leaving a cult or things like that is 
very challenging and mm-hmm. not always forthcoming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think examples that some people might relate to are kind of the classic, you know, second coming cults, right? So on February 2nd of 2005, oh, like end of days. Yeah, we yeah. are going to gather on this hilltop because, uh, you know, whatever, the light will come down and the charismatic mm-hmm. leader, again, like you mentioned, is is spouting this theory and this prophecy and everybody's like, let's go. And of course, that's what happened with QAnon too, with January 6th, in, you know, yeah. in January 20th, people were waiting for this like kind yep. of last minute military takeover. And then it happens, mm-hmm. the day passes, the light does not shine down. And you think at that point that reason would set in. And, and this is where I think yeah. we make a, a mistake as humans. We think logic yeah. is, very convincing yeah. and what we actually see is that what happens in those groups is they go oh it didn't happen today hmm we must be wrong about the day <laughs> move the goalpost <laughs> they just move the right. goalpost and they all yeah. go back to their happy you yeah. know kind of like um you know place where they gather and it's not like you know in those moments people say fraud and how dare you and how could you lied to us mm-hmm. we really just look for confirmation bias. We want to believe in what we believe, yep. we're attached to what we believe. We've invested a lot it's of them. that worldview, right? Yep. Like to yep. change a worldview, you and I both know how traumatizing that can be. Yeah. And yeah. so people go to the most extreme lengths to protect the way they see the world. Right. It's right. So scary. logic is not uh, the answer. Although, I mean, at times, when there's consistent, repetitive, respectful, respectful, respectful evidence mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. consistently put forth, mm-hmm. eventually that can, that's been shown to have an impact, which kind of goes back to what you were talking about, which is how do we bridge these divides? How do we sit down in these spaces where maybe I don't have a lot of respect for your ideology, but maybe mm-hmm. I have still respect for you as a fellow human being, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like you said, seek to understand. And that's very challenging. That's very challenging, especially when not both parties are as willing to do that. You uh-huh. know, so there's one party that's more willing than the other, mm-hmm. um, especially well, speaking of families. And yeah, especially, and I think a factor we haven't really touched on yet for those that are a bit more susceptible to conspiracy, conspiratorial thinking up to potentially being susceptible to cult, like joining, you know, is, is really remember that what I was saying a little bit with the difficulty tolerating uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So the swinging to the other side is rigid. Like, Mm -hmm. I know this is happening. I know that there's a cabal of powerful people running a pedophile ring. Like I know that because it makes sense. And like, it is when someone's in that level of rigidity, we have to consider that aspect maybe first before trying to talk them out Mm -hmm. because that's, that's a pretty fixed, as you know, and we know with our training like that, you don't come out, that was a sledgehammer. Like that's, that, that would go terribly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is that a lot of times people think, oh, it's reason that wins out emotion. And what we know through the research and through a lot of, I was at Jonathan Haidt's Mm -hmm. book. um, A Righteous Mind. Yes, The Righteous righteous Mind, mind. where really it's not, you know, if, 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 if reason was so reasonable. Yeah. (laughs) Many of us would have a lot of the same ideas. We would all use it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But we've all had emotional experiences. For which we take that either those logical ideas and we sift them through our emotional experiences that then you know equate mm-hmm. to what makes sense to us and yeah. why we have the same information come at this you know two very similar people and have varying results, which makes so much sense to me. And I, I hate to keep bringing up the Nexium thing, but it was the the last one I watched mm-hmm. of the kind of cult like what happened. But it's the emotional connection and that just joy in connecting with others that that was the entry point. Mm-hmm. And, and then they can enter in the things, the, those in power that are totally unethical. The, the words don't escape me to even what to label them, you know, but 
just the, they can enter in those those aspects of the cult later because there's already been this this uh this emotional deeply felt connection and experience and i just think the way out of it is probably similar mm -hmm. you know it's probably that simple actually mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that so if we can stick with human connection and be patient which i know is easier said than done <laughs> but i'll still say the words you know it still rings true to me <laughs> right right yeah for sure well and i think you know it's interesting because i i think too a lot of times as humans we are kind of in between competing principles you know like on the one hand I don't think anybody would say you should always trust authority. You should mm -hmm. always, you know, believe the, you know, each and every scientist out there, you know, or, or things like that. Like, it's good to have some critical thinking skills and to challenge and to be able to ask questions. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's healthy. And it's good for people in authority and who have trainings and things to be questioned and to have to think exactly. about their theories and their evidence, quote unquote. On the other hand, it's also not good. The other side of that is kind of anarchy. Like we're not going to believe in any authority. No None authority. of it. <laughs> Nihilism. All authority is bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, good you know, point. And the person with like, you know, a degree in welding is just as much an authority on cancer as the person who went to, you know, medical. Very good point. So, <laughs> yeah. I think authority does matter when it's checked and when it's, critically mm -hmm. thought through and questioned, mm -hmm. and, you know, and also people who maybe have more of a lived experience also matter because, you know, maybe they don't have the training, but they've lived through the cancer treatment or they've lived through something that's problematic that their, their experience is important to listen to. I totally yeah. agree. I love that point. I think it's very, just kind of paints kind of the complexities of what's happened politically and in our culture just those those tense points those uh, tensions all right so I think if we could just kind of maybe go through a list of things that people could think about like just good questions to ask yourself to make sure that you're not you know kind of falling vulnerable to these kinds of things and I'm just going to share a few that I've come up with and right. then kind of you know oh my brainstorm here with me but perfect I think it's a pretty good idea I've learned in my oh so wise 48 years to have a gentle mistrust of myself yes. <laughs> if I'm way certain about something that's probably a good time to go hmm yep. why am I so certain about this right yes I absolutely agree right. with that Am I a little bit too certain, right? So I think that's a good general way to just approach ourselves. Not that we can't trust ourselves completely, but just in general, a nice healthy dose of mistrust. I like that you so. said healthy, <laughs> right? Because I know you and I work with a lot of similar people who like perpetually self-doubt. Yeah. And so it's like, that's that. not what we're talking about. <laughs> you need to we're trust. talking them. about like a healthy, generous, like, okay, I might be a little stubborn on that right now. <laughs> so that's, I love that. Yeah. So that's one thing I also thought about, you know, do I have a diversity of resources yes. that's leading me to this space, you know, yes. or am I just listening to one group or one type of ideology? So what do other folks have to say about this? And yep. am I resistant to that? And if so, why? Yep. Is that fair? Exactly. And then I think the last one I had is just kind of back to your comment about rigidity is do I tend to be somebody who has some level of flexibility mm -hmm. and I admit I'm wrong can I say I'm sorry can I say huh let me think about that and which are all kind of flexible traits versus yep. that staunch you know kind of like Rigid, right no stagnant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so what might you add to the list I know <sighs> well I'm like a little nervous but I might be daring to go there <laughs> okay just because there's so much you'll, daring. <laughs> my, I don't yeah so when it comes to news sources just I just know there's a lot going on right now but do the the sources that I look to give a crap about journalistic integrity do they do they 
print apologies if they're wrong? Do they try to cite sources when possible? Are they are they consistent with other news sources across that are, that are totally un and, and are they not? And is that interesting? Like maybe there might be a good reason that they're doing something different. But I do think that we have. I do, I just think there has been a real lumping in to like media is problematic and every time someone has said that it's like that is too big of a it's such a big concept it's like saying the economy is problematic it's like mm-hmm. uh-huh yeah <laughs> there's stuff that we need to talk about but also like that's way too oversimplified mm-hmm. and we still need to be able to get news um or we're going to swing to more problematic isolation and so there are news sources that are dedicated to journalistic integrity that will print apologies or they'll you know they at least pretend to care yeah they'll correct you know yeah Um, and then there's others that they will spout off things and do not care mm -hmm. if it's framed in a way that is so uncharitable and you know and and so i i think it's important to to look through that lens when we are taking in information yeah 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 and as you mentioned the media i think it's also important to be careful about how much time we are spending in spaces that are meant to be somewhat vitriolic yeah. right like so at some true. level all news is kind of trying to get your attention you know yep. even fairly, you know, middle of the ground, uh, news sources, but, and, and we know that there's a slant towards negative news. Cause we, as humans pay attention to negative things more yep. than positive things. I, one of the things yep. I did a few years ago that I'm really glad about is I followed a uh, certain like positive news threads, you know, like on Facebook I or something, that. all they do is just post like, you know, things that are happening that are cool people that did nice things or, um, new research that was, you know, created or new medicine that was founded. That. And that has been really helpful to see that in my thread. There's a great, I wish I knew the name of it right now, but for, um, there was a great thread that I followed. If I can remember it, I'll try to put it in the comments, but of good news of black folks, like I love what, that. What black people doing that are edifying, you know, our community and things that they're mm-hmm up to and studying and doing and that's been phenomenal so I had a client tell me and I still need to go find it but there was a thread they follow that is world news and it excludes U.S. so it just kind of helps feed like other news going on so because we can be so U.S. centric Mm -hmm. here and I mean what we're talking about is cultivating our feeds and like making sure we're in the driver's seat with as much as we can be with our own news feeds. Information that is being kind yeah. of in a sense indoctrinated into our brains. You know, yep. we indoctrinate ourselves. Yes. All we're doing is listening to one news source. Yep. So I think, and that can happen on both sides of, you know, the typical aisle per se. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that I think is good practice just from a differentiation skills, because most of us, when we, when we hear an idea that we don't like or agree with, you know, we get prickly, however that shows up in your body. Um, I think it's good to know, to be mindful about how that shows up in your body. So I feel it kind of like this heat in my chest and my throat. Mm -hmm. And I start getting like my, my eyebrows start furrowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I start looking very concerned. Yes, (laughs) I'm probably not very pleasant to. (laughs) (laughs) Yes on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so I have to use my own physiology. So and also, true. am I able to, instead of immediately retort, like you're wrong, or I don't agree, or actually, this is, you know, the truth. Am I able to instead ask a question? That's, I love that. Can I practice that mm-hmm. in my relationship? So why, why is that important to you? Or where, you know, where are you getting that information or, you know, what's, what's meaningful to you about that? Um, that. Why does that matter? You know, those are kind of some good questions. These are things I have to practice all the time and be aware of all the time, you know, and it's, it's, I think just so good relationship wise anyway, but right now we just need more of it 
oh my gosh, I would give anything for some important people to ask me more questions about why that's important to me. And I, I want to, I want to give that mm -hmm. to hopefully receive it for some, you know, but not holding my breath, but yeah. 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 Well, awesome. I know I've had you for the hour that you gave me so graciously of your very uh -huh. valuable time. I always appreciate and love our discussions. Is there anything that I'm not asking you or leaving off the table that you wanted to make sure we covered today? Oh man, I am. Uh, I don't think so. I could talk about this stuff forever. And so yeah. it's, it's, I'm glad we're, we're talking now. If we can talk more in the future, it'd be great. I would love to have you back on. That would be awesome. Be Especially fun. in that intersection of your PhD yeah. and, and what you're studying in particular with the media. I'd love to go over it. It's yeah. awesome. <laughs> all right. So hopefully the takeaways from today is we're all susceptible. We're all human. <laughs> uh, be no, nice. The what? Be nice. Be nice. <laughs> Especially when it's hard. That's the most important time. <laughs> right. Especially when it's hard. Yes. And being nice doesn't mean that we can't hold people accountable. I or, love that. Yes. You know, that, I'm that so glad. It doesn't mean that we have to just say everything's okay when it's not. Because I do think sometimes, you know, those are messages too that I think, you know, justice is important, you know, to yeah. say, oh, well, let's not do this or that because we need unity. Well, sometimes you need justice to feel like there's safety and unity that comes back, you know. We so. have to hold, be able to hold responsible. And I think that's what's been so tough is I think we've seen such a difficulty in holding all of those tensions, just of holding responsible, but through charitable lenses. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I hope to see more of that. And I, I hope, I hope it can lead us to a better place. Yeah, I think so. And then the evolution of the human, which is ongoing, hopefully we can improve <laughs> over time. So here's I think to that. I, I think, yes. we have, you know, it's just, it's just an ongoing process. And oh, in the grand scheme, I will say studying conspiracy theories throughout history, mm -hmm. we're fine. <laughs> Which is hard to remember during times like this, but yeah. the there has been horrific things happen to yeah. people based on nothing, yeah. like based on difficulty tolerating uncertainty. Yes. Like we're we're okay, but it's still we we still got some stuff to work on. <laughs> yeah, we need to to yeah. work on these issues that can still cause harm. A lot of harm. Yep. Well, thank you, Kristen. I hope you this have been fun evening and we will definitely <laughs> reconnect and I yes. hope everybody that's listening got something out of this to at least try to take home and, and yeah. you know a little tip here or there to practice so we can all practice and I'm going to commit to that as well so me too thanks Natasha <laughs> have I'll a talk good to you bye-bye bye-bye And there is space there To find yourself in her embrace Some places should be left alone So we can always go To the homeland of the heart
To the home and 